Hey everyone, welcome to the Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Gerenholtz. I am an um, anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins. I um, am an active volunteer at Pikeville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving as one of the medical directors, uh, associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of the Baltimore County Fire Department and Dr. Pollock's office, on behalf of the EMS office, Director Shannon, Captain Stewart, Captain Nats, thank you for being here. Thank you for what you guys do. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. Uh, shout out today to Ashley Brooks, who is in uh, uh, our Zoom meetings with us. Ashley is a young member at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company. She has generously offered to help us run the Zoom platform. Ashley is also the one who is going to be controlling the attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, she'll send out a link sometime during this presentation uh, in the chat function. Uh, you can click on that link. You can enter a couple of pieces of information and you can get your MIM CEUs. So if you want your MIM CEUs, keep, out, keep an eye out on the chat function. Ashley, at some point, will send out a link. Um, and click on that link, enter some information. Uh, MIM says that we have to resolve all attendance issues during this presentation and during this training, that we're not able to uh, uh, resolve any issues around uh, documenting attendance after the training is done. So please reach out to me via the chat or by text or to Ashley during the presentation if there are any concerns at all about being able to get to that link and sending in your information to get your CEUs. Uh, so tonight we have uh, Neil Lichter. Neil Lichter is the program director for Pathfinders at Autism. Neil joined Pathfinders for Autism in October of 2013. Neil is responsible for the daily intake and questions and concerns from parents, caregivers, educators, professionals, and individuals with autism spectrum disorder. As a trainer, Neil has provided an understanding of ASD training since 2014. Audiences include students from kindergarten to college, educators, police, first responders, medical personnel, and many others across the state of Maryland. Neil is also responsible for helping to plan many of the workshops that Pathfinders for Autism collaborates on around Maryland. Neil is married with two sons, one of which who has autism. Neil, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for offering your time and your generosity of your knowledge. Uh, Neil, I think you had suggested that if there are questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, and then you're going to create some natural break where we'll pause, yeah. and we'll address all the questions in the chat. Is that how we can handle that? Yeah, that sounds good. When we'll do questions in the middle and then questions at the end, uh, and I told the young lady to uh, message me if I'm running on too long and we have a lot of questions building up, so I'd be glad to uh, answer any questions for you, no problem. Great. Thanks so much again. My pleasure. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come out and present tonight. I'm always happy to be able to present this uh, this this presentation to uh, anybody who will listen. Uh, so I have done trainings all over the state of Maryland with Pathfinders for Autism. We're an organization that's been around for 20 years now, uh, providing resources, trainings, uh, free workshops, free family fun events to the state of Maryland. Uh, organization started many years ago by B.J. Serhoff, guy who played for the Orioles his wife and a bunch of other parents as a way for families to be able to find resources. And we've grown over 20 years uh, to be fortunate enough to be uh, training first responders and police and hospital staffs and hospital systems around Maryland uh, in an understanding autism, understanding intellectual developmental disability training uh, presentation. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here uh, and, we'll, and we'll jump in and get started um, tonight. So. Why should you care? Why does it matter? Why is this important? Why were we doing these uh, all over the state of Maryland? Uh, and now we're doing them virtually all over with, with people tuning in sometimes for our presentations from uh, the UK and Australia. Um, why is this important? There are more individuals uh, with intellectual developmental disabilities with autism uh, in public, functioning, uh, circulating, working at jobs, driving uh, than ever before. Uh, I graduated. Uh, a long time ago, I'm 51 years old. Uh, and when I went to high school, there were kids with disabilities weren't in classrooms with us. They were in separate parts of the building or in, or in separate classes and you never saw them. Uh, but now kids are uh, integrated in classes and included in classes and part of 
part of the community more and more. So you're going to see more individuals with disabilities in your daily life, in your job, um, on your calls, um, as you go through uh, doing your job. So it's important to have a basic understanding of uh, what some of these intellectual developmental disabilities are uh, and the common characteristics they share uh, and how interacting uh, thinking and, and communicating is sometimes difficult. So we're gonna talk all about that. Uh, this is why I care, uh, that's Max. Max is a 16 year old, uh, he's the one in the black t-shirt, um, uh, if you couldn't figure that out. Uh, his autism uh, impacts him through language, uh, through behavior, through anxiety, um, through all kinds of things, stress him out, get him upset. He hates virtual school, he wants to leave, he needs to know what's coming up. It's a stressful time for him, puberty is no fun, uh, something we're going through now, but that's why I care. I need to make things better for him. I wanna make your job easier if you have to interact with him in an emergency situation and having an idea of some things that might work uh, when communicating verbally is not working for him. Um, so it's just a way to, to get you some information to make your job easier uh, and hopefully make Max's life and other individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities lives easier as well. Um, so we're gonna start off with a video. A lot tonight, you're gonna hear me say anxiety creates behavior uh, because I truly believe that the anxiety some individuals with IDD feel functions and turns into behaviors that you're gonna see which sometimes might be uh, a call you might get for someone having behavior problems and meltdowns and things like that. Um, so this is um, this is my buddy. Uh, he's in his happiest place. He's in his pool. Uh, this is not Max. Uh, this is another young man that does trainings with us. Uh, and, and he's in his happiest place. The person who talks to him in the video is mom. She's the person he lives with, loves her the most. So he's very relaxed and very happy right now. Uh, and let's watch the video real quick. Yeah. Hi, stop a minute. Kyle, look at me. Look at me. Come over here. Come over here. What are you scripting? Kyle. Kyle. Come. Kyle. Kyle, come over here. Come over here. Come over here. Come here a minute. Come here. Come here. Tell me your name. Him! No. No. This is mommy's question. Tell me your name. Kyle Hell. Tell me your phone number. Four. Quietly. Nine seven 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 five four Saint James Walk. No, T listen. Marilyn. Stop. Be patient. Your phone number. Four. Four. four three. Nine. Nine. Seven. 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 seven, seven, seven zero, zero. Five. five one, one. Three. Three. Good. And what, Kyle? Come here. One more. Hi. Come over here. Where do you live? Marysville. Marysville. Good job. Okay. Kyle, try to keep your voice down. Um, so that's Kyle in his happiest place. The least amount of anxiety interacting with somebody that he knows and he's familiar with. And when sometimes you're going to be interacting with, with individuals with autism or other IDDs, intellectual developmental disabilities, they're not going to be in the most anxiety-free environment. So imagine trying to communicate and get information from someone like Kyle, who clearly knows his information but struggles with the communication piece, how is it going to be to get information out of him, name, address, phone number, um, in an anxiety-filled situation? So I'm hopefully able to talk to you tonight about some things to think about with communication and sensory processing and social interaction and behavior um, that can help clarify and, and maybe explain some of the things you see. I'm not expecting anybody who's in the presentation tonight to go on a call and be able to make a diagnosis. That's not your job. Uh, that's not what's expected of you uh, in, in, in you performing the duties of your job. But all I'm saying is these are the, this is the, when I say IDDs, this is the list of disabilities going down the left side of our column that I'm talking about. These are developmental, these are brain disorders. These are not mental disorders. There is comorbidity, between, you know, individuals who struggle with their mental health as well as having uh, a developmental disability. But the point of my chart is that it doesn't really matter if you know what the diagnosis is. These are the common core characteristics that are common between all of these disabilities. 
So I don't need you to know whether the individual you're working with has autism or Down syndrome or Tourette's. Uh, if you can identify someone struggling with communication, if you can identify somebody who's struggling with sensory processing, uh, if you're identifying somebody who's struggling with behavior or exhibiting odd social cues or not understanding social cues, um, you can start to think then how do we well, think back on what we talk about today and how can I interact and how can I make things easier for that individual because if you can make things easier it's going to make your job easier. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about those four uh, communication, sensory processing, social interaction, uh, and behavior. So if you would if you had googled uh, autism spectrum disorder or, or intellectual developmental disability model uh, not too long ago it would be more of a linear thing. Um, uh, further up on the right side of that arrow would be maybe what would have been called Asperger's syndrome. But that's no longer diagnosed according to the DSM-5, uh, but we still use the terminology because people still have that written down on medical records and on school records. I mean, newly diagnosed, it's not getting diagnosed that way, but people who are older and teenagers and adults may have that on their medical records. So I still use the terminology often characterized by milder characteristics may not need those daily life supports, getting up, getting dressed, feeding, toileting, things like that, but really may struggle with the no social skills, not able to make relationships, struggles with great anxiety, uh, unable to communicate, things like that. Uh, and that's the way their disability impacts them, impulsivity. Um, across the other side of that spectrum would be somebody who's, uh, when, when Max was first diagnosed, I'm picturing uh, ear cancel, noise canceling headphones on, an individual rocking back and forth maybe no words, ye, 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 vocalizing that way. And someone who may need more support daily, getting up, getting dressed, feeding, toileting, school, going to a day program, things like that. The important thing I want you to remember is that you need to presume intellect. Just because a person might be heavily impacted by their autism or by their disability, doesn't mean uh, that, that, that they don't have an IQ, that they're not able to understand what you're saying, uh, that, that they just may struggle to communicate uh, and get the words out. So the more support somebody needs has nothing to do with their level of intelligence. My coworker Trisha's son is that young man with the headphones on and low verbal. Um, but that young man watches all of his movies in foreign languages and feeds lines of dialogue into internet translators so he can hear those movies in Portuguese and Slovak and Arabic. He takes in that knowledge. He's 25 years old. He's got an IQ. Now we're never going to have a conversation in any of those languages because the communication piece for him is so difficult. Um, but clearly he's interested in it and in studying it and is fascinated by it. So presume intellect is a major piece of what we talk about. This is sort of a newer model that people use for uh, in, uh, the way they're, they're, they're diagramming their disability, showing where on a chart um, you may, someone may be struggling with these different categories, language and motor skills and executive function. And, and the more close to the center, the more impacted someone is. And I'm, sometimes when I'm interviewing young individuals on the autism spectrum who are gonna come work in our office, um, uh, I, I'm sort of picturing this in my head, where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses? How am I gonna find my way to work with this person to make it successful for them? Uh, we hired a young man as a data entry specialist who was a say hello, say goodbye kind of guy, not many words, but he's fantastic doing the data entry for us and that he's found a great job and he's a big part of it. We miss him terribly. We haven't seen him since March, um, but uh, we found the niche for him and what he was like, what he was really good at, what he was passionate for, uh, and he was able to find a job with us and he's a great, I always try and figure out the way someone's passions or what they're good at. It's a good starting point. Uh, in that communication piece. So the most recent prevalence statistics are one in 54 children nationwide, according to the CDC, uh, one in 34 boys. Here in Maryland, it's one in 52, uh, and it's one in 33 boys, um, one in 128 girls uh, in the state of Maryland. So uh, it's not a matter of if, it's when you're going to be interacting. Maybe you already have. With these numbers, maybe you've got a a brother or a sister or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew or a neighbor or whoever uh, who does who is on the autism spectrum. Uh, maybe you've had some experience interacting, but it's such a unique and individualized disorder. What what it, what their autism is for them is completely different than what it might be for my son Max. The prevalence statistics for developmental disabilities um, are right there: three and seventeen. Uh, excuse me, one and six for kids three to seventeen, and then it breaks it down by the other ones we had on our chart there. So very high, one in six having a developmental disability. So having a basic understanding of maybe 
some of the things we'll talk about tonight could certainly be helpful. I'm not trying to tell anybody how to do their job. Uh, I'm just trying to give you some things uh, that might be uh, helpful as you go forward. Uh, maybe you'll think of some of the things. These are some of the therapies uh, individuals with uh, on the autism spectrum have gone through. Uh, you may find individuals with, with special diets using homeopathic remedies because some of these things will have a positive effect uh, on their son, their daughter, the person they're taking care of. Um, because if my son has a gluten allergy and I keep giving him foods with gluten and his stomach hurts, and he can't tell me his stomach hurts. So he, he, he exhibits behavior like peeling his clothes off uh, and we take the gluten away. That behavior of peeling your clothes off because you're in pain is gonna go away. But taking gluten out of someone else's diet may have nothing to do with the behaviors you're seeing. So it is, that's what I mean when I'm talking about how unique and individualized it is. Um, like I said, these are the, the general areas of impact. These are the things you see when, or what, on diagnoses, um, uh, communication, sensory processing, social interaction and behavior. Um, so that's sort of how we break up the uh, presentation as we go forward. Um, so I don't have everybody's picture up in front of me. We have 51 people here tonight. I had a pretty big window I just opened so I could see as many of your cameras. Uh, and I noticed nobody put their right hand in the air. So I'm wondering, uh, see, now I'm seeing everybody smiling because you're all realizing, no, no, it's too late now. You can't put your right hand in the air now. Um, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, right there at the top of the page, it said, raise your right hand. And I watched and none of you did it. Um, clearly that's something I wanted you to do. I, I let you know I wanted you to do it by writing it up there. Nobody in the chat wrote, do I need to put my hand in the air? Why is that there? Uh, and we do that because you're going to be asking for the information. You're going to be giving people directions. You're going to be telling people what they need to do. Uh, and you can't assume that everybody communicates the same way. Uh, clearly, this is something I wanted you to do. Uh, you saw it clearly and said, I don't need to do that. I mean, that's that's being difficult. That could be construed as uh, belligerence or uh, not following directions. But maybe you didn't understand I meant raise your right hand just because I didn't say it doesn't mean I don't mean it. So people communicate differently. Uh, and you're going to have to think of some of those sort of out of the box ways to think if you're struggling talking to somebody or dealing with somebody who's struggling with one of these um, uh, areas of deficit. Um, so uh, it, we're talking about like thought processing and it's difficult when anxiety is up to, to get your thoughts straight. Um, it's, it's like dots floating around in space trying and every dot has a thought on it. And you have to pick out the dot and find the answer to the question uh, where you or I, um, you ask me what my address is and I've got a Rolodex in my head that flips right to my address card. I'm dating myself there saying a Rolodex. I don't know how young everybody is, but a Rolodex, never mind. Um, but I have a Rolodex in my head of addresses and I can start rattling them off for you. For my son, he's got to find that address floating around and all the thoughts in his head. And when he's unable to come up with the answer right away, uh, it gets him frustrated. Frustrated meaning anxiety. And I say it again, anxiety creates behavior. So last night, I'm like, hey, Max, um, what do you want for dinner, buddy? And the answers come out of his mouth that make no sense. Yeah, I know you like dogs. Christmas is coming up. Now I understand. I know you're hungry. I'm trying to no, know. I'm not asking you what you did last Tuesday, Max. I need to know what you want. Yes, that's the movie we watched. Why aren't you giving me the answers I'm looking for? I'm getting frustrated. He's getting frustrated, but he's struggling. Yes, we're gonna eat at six. Oh, finally, there's the answer. He knows he's given me wrong answers. He knows he's not answering the question right away. It's frustrating for him. So it's more and more difficult to communicate with him uh, because of all the things that are going on with that thought processing and the language processing. Yes, and there's some more answers that come out occasionally. Um, okay, individuals may communicate with or without words, nonverbal. Uh, population in the autism community is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. Um, that may mean low verbal. I like that term a lot better. Um, some people are able to use all the words uh, but still struggle with their disability and some people struggle with that communication piece. Uh, Technology has been fantastic for communicating in the way that individuals are able to uh, text to talk technology, uh, translation technology. Some people still rely on uh, pet cards, pet cards, uh, what used to be called board maker, but uh, what our hospitals that we go and train and we're like, listen, do you have something like this for individuals who struggle with communication, just being able to point to things so they can understand what's going to be coming next or a, a list of directions. So it's something to look at if they aren't able to process things verbally uh, and communicate with you back and forth that way. 
Um, people may be verbal but not know how to sustain a conversation, not understanding the back and the forth uh, of how the conversation goes. You are citing scripts, um, using memorized phrases and words and expressions uh, to try and communicate. Uh, that's what my son does. My son hates having conversations with people uh, who, who cause him anxiety. So instead of having an actual conversation with you, he's able to plug in quotes from his favorite movies in conversation. And unless you know the movie, it doesn't, it, it, it fits and you won't know, but he's not really answering your question. He's just using words that are comfortable to him so he doesn't have to think of an answer for you. Um, so I've seen him have five minute conversations with my mother where all he's done is these scripts from Toy Story 2 and she has no idea uh, because they fit into the questions. And if she asks him a question, he doesn't have a script for, he walks away or he says, now here's your next line and he tells her what to say so he can keep going. Um, but that's the way he communicates. Um, so you can see there's like, repetitive language, struggles with articulation and Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, um, sometimes harder to understand what someone's saying. Uh, increase anxiety, speech goes faster, even more difficult to understand. Um, direct language, uh, keep it simple. Um, don't say in 10 words that you can say in five. Uh, keep your questions easy to answer and keep them hard to misinterpret because those misinterpretations can cause those misunderstandings or negative interactions or things like that. Um, so think of what you ask somebody uh, before you ask the question and see if there's a way it could be misinterpreted because you might get answers back uh, that seem rude. Um, my coworker says, never ask an, uh, an individual with autism if you look fat in a dress, if you aren't prepared to hear an honest answer, um, because telling a little white lie is a social skill that you have to learn. And if you're taught not to lie and you're a rule follower, a little white lie makes no sense to you. So you may answer that question. You know, I know if my wife says, do I look fat in this dress? The answer is always going to be no. But some individuals may struggle with that. Sarcasm, metaphors, euphemisms that we all understand and use every single day can be very confusing to somebody who struggles with communication. Um, sarcasm is saying the opposite of what you think. Um, metaphors are using things that aren't necessarily what they look like to describe something. And, and that's going to be a struggle. If you ever saw Big Bang Theory, Sheldon totally doesn't understand sarcasm. I said to Max, you know, here's, an, here's a good example. What did I tell this little boy? You know, I didn't tell him to pick up a chair. I didn't tell him to grab the chair. I told him to take a seat. So he did. But that's not what I meant. And let me, don't get me wrong. He's cute. He's little. He's adorable. Um, so I understand he doesn't understand the language, but that's Max. Max, what do you, you mean take it? Take it where? Take has one definition to Max. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to take it. And it's not so cute from a 16-year-old in school where they're thinking he's being difficult or he's being uh, argumentative or he's not what well, you're, he's, he's doing the opposite of what I tell him to do. He's not following directions, but I could clarify what I want very simple. Max, sit down in the blue chair. That's a clear direction using direct language instead of relying on an expression that not everyone's going to understand. Um, so keep your language easy to understand and difficult to misinterpret. Uh, we told her it was time to hit the road. Not what I meant. But that's the language that you and I think is easy to understand and everyone gets can be confusing for some individuals. Um, receptive and expressive language require additional processing time means that it takes longer for some individuals to understand the words you're using, figure out the answer to your question um, and give you that answer. It takes longer, sometimes up to 20 seconds. Uh, and 20 seconds doesn't seem like a very long time. So I'm gonna, I'm not being rude here. I'm getting my phone out. Um, I'm going to set my stopwatch for 20 seconds and we'll sit quietly for 20 seconds. That's 10. And that's 20 seconds. And that's to answer one question. And then if you ask another question, that clock's gonna start over. And if you keep firing questions at that individual, the anxiety level is gonna go up. And when anxiety goes up, their ability to communicate goes down. Um, hold on, there we go. When their anxiety goes up, I knew that was in there somewhere, their ability to process goes down, thought processing, language processing, communication processing, uh, all of that goes down when anxiety goes up, which makes it, makes it way harder to communicate. And as I'm gonna mention later, here's a sneak peek or spoiler, behavior is communication. 
So the behavior you're going to see is the way to communicate what's creating the anxiety. Um, so we're going to think about that and keep that in mind. Those two arrows uh, are very important. So communication is a big deal to me. I think it's where a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the questions lie, the struggles lie, because I think it starts with communication. So um, we're gonna talk about sensory processing. And after we finish this part of the, the presentation, maybe that's a good time to take a quick break just to answer if there's questions and then we can keep going on because uh, I want you to see everything I've got. Um, sensory processing, brain's ability to take in what's going on around it related to your senses. Um, it can be very difficult for some individuals. This is what it may be like. Imagine that's your every day and imagine that the sounds are brighter or the sounds are brighter. The sounds are louder, the smells are more intense, the lights are brighter. Um, the, the patterns that you see on fabrics may cause your eyes to hurt. I have fluorescent light bulbs in my office. I hate them. Uh, I had fluorescent light bulbs in my kitchen until yesterday. We got them replaced. My wife needed apparently recessed lights, so we got them. Um, and the lighting is so much better and so much more comfortable. I, I mean, the buzzing that I hear overhead, there's little bits of flickering that go on. All of that, I can still do my presentation while it's going on. There's a red light flashing on my phone over here that I can see, but I'm still able to somewhat function and do my presentation. But if all of that created pain or was too loud or too anxiety inducing for me, it would be hard to get through my day every day sitting at my desk doing what I do. Um, so I don't struggle with that piece. You don't have to have an intellectual developmental disability to struggle sensory processing, but um, most people with IDDs or autism do have some form of uh, sensory processing difficulties. Um, and that's an important thing uh, to understand because it creates that anxiety and you'll see the behaviors. Uh, people getting easily overstimulated, going into full meltdown. We're gonna talk about meltdowns uh, because of too much sensory input going on. Um, individuals you might see who are hitting themselves, not in a self-injurious way, clapping their hands together, giving themselves some form of sensory input if they're feeling understimulated, trying to get that sensory input, maybe squeezing you too tight in a hug, seeking that sensory input, understanding body awareness of how dealing, sometimes dealing with steps or dealing with understanding how close they can stand to somebody or knowing what how big they are, or even balance the vestibular system is affected uh, by sensory processing as well. Uh, I think the one that for body awareness is called proprioception. Um, Seizures, uh, often ep uh, epilepsy, often common um, in 20 to 20 to 35 percent of the population with autism, oftentimes gets epilepsy, uh, uh, sometimes uh, early on and sometimes uh, later on during adolescence. Um, it, it develops seizure activity often is mimicked, though, by some of the things that you'll see in individuals uh, with IDDs. Uh, when I talk to police officers, we talk about eye nystagmus, that inability to focus the eye, uh, the eyeball twitching. Um, the ability to just staring out into space, inability to respond. We had to get EEGs, I think they're called, done on Max because he, doctors thought he was having mini seizures, but he doesn't, he wasn't, thank goodness. Uh, he has the ability to just sort of hyper-focus on something and really tune everything else out. Um, um, and when I talk to police or when I talk to hospitals, I'm, look, that can certainly look like inebriation or intoxication. And what looks like one thing might be something completely different. Um, uh, the, the, the sensory processing piece also comes in if we're talking about um, if you show up, you know, uh, you, you're an ENT, using a pen light in someone's eyes might be too intense uh, for something. So maybe letting them know I'm going to need to use this. Now, listen, I understand in emergency trauma uh, situations, you have to do what you have to do and protocols are the most important. What I'm talking about here is if you have somebody that you're communicating with or you're talking to, letting them know I'm going to shine a light in your eye before you do it can ease the anxiety that they might feel with having a light just shoved right in their eye. Um, so I'm talking about when situations are calm, um, if you can think about stuff like that. 
in situations like that, it might make it a little bit easier. Um, so let's see, I see some questions uh, in the in the chat box. Uh, I would love to team up. I'm sorry to hear that about your sons, people calling them names, that's horrible. Uh, you can certainly have my email address, it's at the end, uh, as well as my contact information, and I can put you in touch with the person who can uh, collaborate on any kind of trainings you guys want to do. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, I'm assuming Max, does Max have trigger words uh, that sent him into a crisis? Um, uh, no is a word that causes Max a lot of stress. Uh, but really, one of the words that I find is a trigger word, and, and, I, and I struggle not to use it sometimes uh, because it's part of my vocabulary, is I'm sorry. Um, because I'm sorry to Max is the answer is no, and you're not going to get a, a changed answer. Uh, and I'd say I'm sorry because I truly am sorry that I can't do for him what he wants. Uh, but that is a word that will immediately start getting him aggravated and create anxiety for him. And my wife will be like, stop apologizing. It drives him crazy. But I feel bad that I can't do what I want. So I say I'm sorry. But um, not a whole lot of trigger words, uh, thank goodness, that that uh, that set him off too much. Um, sensory stuff, sometimes if he spills water on his clothing, it causes him a lot of stress. He has to peel it off of him. Uh, it causes him a lot of discomfort to have his clothes sort of stick to him water-wise. Um, uh, so that's one of the things that causes him stress. Uh, should one always assume that the person can read? That's a great question. And when I talk about presumed intellect, I think it depends on the age of the person you're dealing with. Uh, if you have a 26 year old is your patient or you can see he's clearly not a, a four or five year old um, from whatever age kids are learning to read, um, I, I think you can try that. Uh, and if he's unable to read it, you'll know, you can figure that out or you'll know, and then you can go to something else that might be an easier form of communication for them, whether it's uh, uh, finding a picture of something or having one of those pet cards to show and communicate through pictures, uh, maybe a little bit easier uh, for that individual. But I, I would assume always, yeah, that, 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 that somebody who's you know, a teenager or a young man or a young woman uh, is gonna have the ability to read. And if they don't, then you sort of go to that second, second you know, start off what you would normally do, um, if they have, if they can't read, then you have to sort of think of other ways to communicate. Um, is there regional variance in incidence of ASD? Has it changed over time? Uh, yes, there's regional variance, uh, um, but it's not sort of, uh, I'll give you my example. Like uh, in the study where Maryland was one in 52 kids, New Jersey was like one in 36 kids um, on the autism spectrum. And lots of people go, well, you see the stuff that burns into the sky in New Jersey and that's what's going on and that's what's causing the autism. But like Utah was like fourth. So in Utah, not nearly the same thing. So yes, there's regional variances, but it doesn't seem to be tied to anything. Um, maybe access to um, services. That's what we find when we're going across sort of socioeconomic uh, and, and racial lines where it's access to early uh, intervention and things like that, but not but it's the numbers are just sort of scattered differently all across the country where it doesn't seem to have any sort of pattern like it's worst on the worst on worse on the east coast than the west and vice versa. Um, and, and yes, it's changed over time. I think when uh, in, when my older son was born in 2000, autism was one in 150, uh, and now we're at one in 54, one in 54 nationwide. Uh, so yes, it has changed, and I don't know if that's more people being diagnosed or more things falling under the diagnosis or a combination of the two, um, but the number has gone up every year uh, since, since I mean, I think it used to be one in 10,000 like years and years ago. And then, then as recently as 2000, it was one in 150. So um, those are all good questions. Um, how would I describe my son's diagnosis on the spectrum? Uh, difficulties in communication, uh, difficulties in behavior, uh, difficulties in language. Um, uh, he's not an eloper. He's not taking off and running, uh, but he's a very smart young man. He's outstanding on computers uh, when he's comfortable. Uh, he can understand simplified directions and would be able to uh, work in my office to do data entry. He says he's already done some stuff for me that way. Um, but I would say that in an anxiety induced situation, my son, if you come up and cause him great stress, talking to him too quickly uh, is going to tell you where to go and take off running to get away from you. Whereas if you find something to help ease his anxiety, uh, there's more of a chance he'll calm himself down enough to be able to talk to you, to answer his name, his address, his phone number, because he knows it, but in times of great stress, he's not gonna come up with it. And he's more apt to get stressed out and tell you where to go and turn around to get away from you 
and escape the thing that's causing them anxiety. That's always his first um, thing, or to attack the person that's causing them his anxiety. Uh, in the case of more at home, he's never done that to anybody other than who lives in our house. In our house, um, would restraining a child in an ambulance cause major problems? Um, uh, again, I, I think it goes back to protocol. If somebody needs to be restrained, then you restrain them. Um, I, I think um, it, it really depends on it, how flexible you can be. If somebody needs to be restrained, then they need to be restrained, and that has nothing to do with their disability, and that's what comes first is taking care of the patient. Um, but if you have somebody who really doesn't need to be like fully restrained, and they can, if they can sit up and be in a more comfortable position, uh, and it's not going it, it, to... If you're allowed to do that, and I have no idea if you are, um, if you can allow that, that might ease the person's anxiety about the situation they're in. So I think it really doesn't depend on the disability. It depends on the level of injury and the level of flexibility you would have um, for someone. Five seatbelts is a lot, I would imagine. Um, so maybe if you can reduce it to make it a little easier. But if you can't, you can't. And I'm not asking you to change that. Uh, because that is protocol and that's more important than anything else is the person's safety, I think. Um, so let me jump back in because I want to make sure I don't want to keep you all here forever tonight. Um, social interaction is a struggle for individuals uh, with autism, with all kinds of intellectual developmental disabilities. Uh, it is a myth that people with disabilities don't feel the same range of emotions uh, or understand emotions. Um, oftentimes a higher sense of empathy in individuals with disabilities. Uh, oftentimes struggling in times of crisis to respond appropriately um, or respond, you know, if you respond appropriately in times of crisis, you may get the answers to questions that make no sense uh, or there's someone laughing when you're trying to get information out of them. And that is purely uh, an anxiety induced behavior uh, of not knowing how to react. Max thought it was hysterical when I bit it walking down my steps on the ice a couple of years ago and thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen as I went up in the air and landed with my right leg tucked underneath me, behind me, uh, making a horrible noise. And my wife and my older son knew exactly that something was wrong and Max thought it was funny. Um, but 20 seconds, 30 seconds after, after seeing it, after he processed what was going on and saw that I was hurt and all of that, it took him a little longer. He was then helping out and getting me up and getting me inside and bringing me anything first aid related he could find. It just took him a little longer, but the initial reaction was him laughing uh, and then that created anxiety between him and my wife who got mad that he was laughing at me and that escalated everything from there. Um, struggle to, it's a struggle to make peer relationships when you're the person with the behaviors that make you stick out in school or at work uh, or in church or, or in the grocery store. Uh, it's hard to make peer relationships when you don't understand the, the language people use or the jokes they make or how do you watch basketball with all the squeaking of the shoes? I can't watch that. I can't talk about it. Uh, I like to watch shows that are sometimes younger, not as age appropriate for my age. Max loves Sesame Street, he's 16 years old. Uh, and it makes sense to me why Max loves Sesame Street because he doesn't have to interpret how people feel on Sesame Street. You're told immediately, Elmo is happy. Elmo is so happy to see you. Everything is explained to him and he doesn't have to figure out the nuances of language and what people mean and read facial expressions. It's just easier for him to understand that clear, direct language that we talked about. Um, it all comes to behavior with us. Anxiety creates behavior. Behavior is what makes people stick out, what makes people get uh, EP'd from schools, uh, what gets police called on people who, be, who need to be taken out of grocery stores because they're in full meltdown. Um, it's the behaviors. Um, individuals may have, um, I like your question, is there any way to calm a person? And we're definitely gonna talk about some de-escalation stuff. Um, and it, it starts off with this first bullet is, uh, individual, I don't like the term obsessive. It's got a real negative connotation to me. Um, but uh, passions, uh, fascinations, interests, uh, and, and, and my son is most comfortable talking about things he knows about. Uh, and you don't have to participate in the conversation with him if you don't want to, because he's just as happy answering all the questions and, and talking to you about it. And he doesn't really care if you participate. But what I'm saying is, if, if my son is a patient for you, or if my son is, is next to me, and if I'm injured, uh, and he's stressed out, he may, I might, you're going to have to help him as well. Um, so if you know my son, if you're looking at my son, he's got his Ravens t-shirt on, he's probably got a bag of toys in his hand, maybe they're Pokemon toys, maybe they're Mario Brothers toys, all of those things are passions for him. So instead of saying, what's your name, what's your address, what's your phone number, 
maybe try and reduce that stress if you might be feeling and saying, oh, I love the Ravens. Did you watch the game the other day? And again, this is in times when you can do this when, when, when you're not in emergencies, but um, when you have the opportunity and things are, you need to start that conversation. Uh, but individuals may act impulsively, um, take off running when you're not expecting them to. So if you're gonna have somebody on the side of the road that you suspect may be struggling with a disability, an intellectual developmental disability, maybe having somebody sitting with them the whole time and, uh, and making sure they're gonna be safe. Because I can tell you, if my son is seated on one side of the road, and his bag of toys are in my wrecked car on the other side of the road, he's going to run across the road to get his toys out, regardless of safety. So you have to keep an eye on him. And that impulsivity is certainly part of the disability. Um, medication effects oftentimes affect behavior. Um, if you, A lot of times, uh, kids who are getting EP'd from school, we find out are, are not getting their medication at home when they're supposed to be, or, or, or dad has them sometimes and doesn't give them the medication, or mom doesn't give them, and they send them to school, and the kid's got such a struggle behaviorally, uh, they need to be emergency petitioned out into a hospital. Paramedics get called or EMTs get called to take them to the hospital. And now you're dealing with an individual with behaviors, uh, which may be caused by lack of medication. And you may not know whether that kid took his medicine that day or not. And then you will see behaviors. So trying to reduce that anxiety, that tension, whatever's causing the upsetness, whether it's the lights in the room or too many people asking questions or needing to go for a walk or whatever it is, is creating this behavior uh, might just be creating created by the effects of medication. Like I said, it was a spoiler, behavior is communication. Looking at a behavior as a way for an individual is communicating whether it's they're in pain. Uh, my coworker's uh, son um, is, a, is a very bright young man, the young man who studies foreign languages, but struggles communicating so much that every, every couple of times a year, Trish will see him start banging on his head like this. And, and what she's realizing is not self-interest typically, so she doesn't ever see this type of behavior, but what she's realized is when he starts doing this, he's feeling something hurts in this general area. Because over the years, when she sees this, she has to sort of go doctor hopping to find out what's wrong, but it's been a sinus infection, uh, it's been a toothache, it's been prescription eyeglasses that needed to be adjusted. Uh, it's been all kinds of different things for some individuals, for that young man, um, but she doesn't know He's feeling it until he starts doing this because he can't tell her what hurts. It's been strep throat. It's been acid reflux because it hurts in his throat. Um, so she has to sort of figure it out just by understanding this behavior is creating pain for him. Um, oftentimes individuals struggle adjusting to a new routine or a situation. If you can lay out a schedule of things you're gonna do for my son, it's gonna reduce anxiety for him. Um, he wants to know what's coming next. He hates the not knowing what's coming next. That creates anxiety for him. So if you're working on my son and, and, and you have to work on his leg and you say to him, I'm just going to take your shoe off. I'm going to pull your pant leg up. I'm going to squeeze your knee. Just giving him those verbal steps may, may, because not everything works every time, may reduce his anxiety because you're telling him what you're going to be doing before you do it, uh, as opposed to just ripping his shoe off, taking his sock off, rolling his pant leg up for a person with sensory processing difficulties, that could all be painful. But if he, if he knows what's coming, maybe he's able to deal with the anxiety. So letting him know uh, what you're gonna be doing. Um, so this is an example, and I won't let this run too long, but this is a, this is a lady uh, who does trainings with us, um, who's got a son, uh, struggles with, with words, low verbal, um, who had a bad day at school uh, and had to be taken out of school uh, mom couldn't get him out because he was really rough. Um, and we'll run this and we'll talk a little bit about it as we go forward. Hey guys, so I'm sitting here in my car. It's um, one o'clock in the afternoon. I've had a half day. Today was his last day of school. And um, needless to say, it was a really, really rough day. Um, I actually spent the whole school day at his school um, working with his social worker, making calls to insurance companies and treatment facilities and um, got nowhere. The insurance company actually um, wondered why I hadn't thought about putting him in a group home versus trying to get him some inpatient treatment that might take just a few months. Um, so it was disheartening and discouraging to say the least, but his school staff have been really amazing. They've tried really hard. Um, when 12 o'clock rolled around and they were bringing him out to the car to me, they actually were carrying him 
one person to each limb. So two people were each holding one of his feet, two people holding his arms, having to carry him because he was um, kicking, trying to strip his clothes off, throwing stuff, biting. Um, right now he's sitting next to me in the car, no pants on, he's peed in my car, he's pooped in my car. Um, I'm waiting on medics to come help transport him to the emergency room. He's going to have to be admitted, not to the most appropriate treatment facility, but to um, a hospital to at least help us get him calmed down and under control, maybe with some medication. And um, it's really heartbreaking. I, I don't even... I don't even have the words. I can't even take my own son to the hospital because he's ripping my glasses off my face and moving the mirrors and throwing poop and peeing. And um, I just, after everything he's been through in his life, I just don't feel like this is where we should be. So, uh, rough day. Um, has to go to the hospital. Um, paramedics have been called, gets taken to the hospital. Um, because of these behaviors, because he's not able to calm himself down, the throwing the pieces, peeing, pooping everywhere. Um, they're trying to figure out what's causing the behavior. They want to uh, sedate him for two days and figure out what's going on, um, which you imagine sedating a child like this, getting a tube down his throat or down his nose, how difficult that can be for someone who's low verbal, nonverbal, unable to express themselves. Um, mom, who we were friends with, was telling her what, you know, was telling us once he was at the hospital, the people who would come in and work on him in the hospital, he's a 15 year old man and we talk, young man and we talked about presumed intellect, um, but would come in and not even address him by his name, not even say hello or good morning to him, just come in in the hospital and start working on him and putting needles in him or taking blood pressure on him or putting a mask over his face and no communication because he struggled so much verbally and with behaviors, they weren't presuming intellect. They were said they were looking at the way his, his autism was uh, projecting out and saying, there's no way this young man's gonna be able to communicate effectively with me. Uh, so why do I have to try and communicate with him? Um, but it just weren't, weren't treating him right. So um, struggled quite a bit. Um, and then uh, I'll show you this. This is right after. When we talk about rule out pain. All right. Hey, guys. Um... <laughs> I'm so tired. I don't even know what I'm talking about. We've been moved to another hospital downtown. Um, Devin has an obstruction in his stomach. His stomach is distended to basically the entire size of his abdomen. So um, we came like around midnight. Was it about midnight we came yeah. downtown? And uh, he's getting ready to have a tube put down through his nose. And um, they will have to, you know, suction out the fluid and the air and then see what the obstruction is and kind of go from there. Um, but because Devin is not going to tolerate anything put down his nose or staying in there for a day, he's going to be sedated probably for a day or more, which worries me a little bit. Um, but we're in a good hospital and everybody's doing a great job and things are moving a lot quicker. <laughs> so what looked like one thing was a kid having a really bad day at school was someone who was in pain. And when you look at some of the behaviors he was exhib exhibiting, peeling his pants off, taking his clothes off, pooping, you know, all of that is, is communication of the pain he's in, the discomfort. He doesn't want those clothes around his midsection. He needs to get whatever's in and out because it hurts. Um, so, but figure, how do you know what's going to go on? So again, ruling out pain because of behavior uh, is very important. Um, you saw those two hours earlier. I always say anxiety creates behavior. Um, and things to consider as well. Uh, may require more time on site, uh, may continue to goose, do something after being told to stop. You might be interacting with an individual who flaps their hands. And this is a way, um, uh, some individuals, call it, it's called stimming. It's a way to ease anxiety. And my suggestion is if you're talking to somebody and they're communicating with you and they're doing this and you're fine with that, let them go. Because telling them to stop doing this is going to then create some anxiety because maybe this is what they need just to be able to talk to you and just to be able to communicate with you. Uh, and again, for my son, you would have to say, Max, I need you to stop for two minutes because then he would know he could start again in two minutes, not knowing when he'd be able to start again. 
would create so much anxiety for him that he wouldn't be able to answer your question anyway. You couldn't just let him do this while he talked to you. But if you need him to stop, give him a, give him a, a set time uh, and stick to it if you can, of course, because um, uh, it might ease some of that anxiety. Uh, you may find kids who may be more aggressive or respond violently during rescue. Listen, if my kid's in a building and it's burning and or someone's got to go get my kid, you, I don't care if he's, he's grumpy or yelling or screaming, throw him over your shoulder and walk out. But you may come across individuals who struggle more because of that anxiety um, where, where they maybe need to relax and, and calm down uh, before you can try and start some things. Again, uh, it really depends on protocol in that situation, but you're going to have individuals that react with that fight or flight uh, and try and get away and escape whatever's causing them anxiety. Um, individuals may hide when scared uh, in places that look way too small for them to hide in. So if you have to, uh, if, if you're called as part of a young person who goes, or an older person who goes missing, wandering and eloping, if you get those calls, um, look in small places when you're looking uh, for individuals. There's a, there's a high attraction to water, lights, uh, reflections, shiny objects, things like that. Uh, real risk uh, of wandering and eloping with individuals drowning uh, because of the fascination with water. It doesn't matter the time of the year. Um, not know how to react in emergency situations because it is that spike in anxiety and it's not something you've practiced before and, 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 and prioritizing what's important and how to keep yourself safe may not. Like I said, my son's gonna run across to get those toys out of the car because that's gonna reduce his anxiety if he's on the other side of the street. Um, he doesn't understand the dangerous situation sometimes. Um, one time we were working with, 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 with uh, emergency crews and they said that, uh, that one of the people they had worked with as a patient had a bad reaction to the lights reflecting off of the diamond plating on the back of the ambulance and was able to communicate how painful it was because he kept covering his eyes. There's that behavior that's communication, covering his eyes and turning his eyes away. So they put a blanket on top of the, of the diamond plating um, and it reduced that. And just something that simple, looking at the way a person is reacting, they might not be able to say those lights hurt, but looking at that behavior, you might understand that person struggling with sensory processing. Uh, and maybe if you can find that one little thing to do, uh, it might help ease them, uh, ease, ease their anxiety. Individuals with disabilities oftentimes have a higher tolerance for pain. Uh, I've seen my kid run smack into a wall and just bounce right off it and keep going where other kids, you would think they'd be down for a month. Um, if you have the ability to evaluate for injury from toe to head, it's way less anxiety inducing, but you know what? Again, it goes back to protocol. I'm saying when you have the ability to do that, to say, I'm gonna start examining you to make sure you're okay. I'm gonna start at your leg and work my way up. I'm gonna push on your stomach. Telegraphing what you're gonna do uh, can help ease anxiety. But again, your training is the most important thing. And I want you to think of this as ways to help if that person's struggling with anxiety in a nice calm in a calmer situation. I keep showing Josh. Josh is a young man uh, with Down syndrome who trains. He's one of our trainers who when we're out live uh, comes and talks about how he cut his finger off on a log splitter when he was a little kid uh, and how he remembers didn't hurt. Uh, he was more worried about getting in trouble for getting blood all over the truck and he wasn't supposed to be playing with the log splitter anyway. And his father says he never cried. He never screamed. He was never nervous. He's, he was worried that he was going to get in trouble and that he wasn't going to get pizza for dinner that night. He just, uh, he ended up walking around. Uh, he, he got the finger reattached, thank goodness. Uh, not too long ago, he had torn two ligaments in his knee. He's a gym rat. The kid works out like a bean. Um, uh, and, but he had torn two ligaments in his knee, but he just walked around with it like that with a limp uh, until finally he, he, he fell down and his dad was like, well, let's go, you know, figure it out. Uh, and they ended up realizing he had torn ligaments in his knee, but he walked around with it like that for months, just didn't bother him. He's got a very high tolerance for pain. Um, it's an important slide when I work with police officers to let them know that a, a, a grip that you use on somebody uh, that typically might work really well on one person may not work on a person with a disability and it might get pushed uh, too far. That's also something we talk about with restraint uh, when, they, when, when, when they're restraining individuals. Uh, low muscle tone across the upper chest uh, puts them at a higher risk for positional asphyxiation, um, something often that doesn't often happen, thank goodness, in our community. But uh, a young man named Ethan Saylor in Frederick, Maryland, a number of years ago, it's exactly what happened. Uh, he got restrained on his stomach with his hands behind his back, was unable to pick himself up to take the breath and fill his lungs and ended up uh, dying in custody that way. Um, so it is a risk, but, it, but I'm hoping you guys aren't going to be restraining people on their stomachs with their hands behind their back. But 
if you come up on a, on a scene and the police officer's there and he's got someone restrained that way, uh, it is not a very safe hold. So um, there it is right there. Um, we talked about medications. We talked about how it might appear to be uh, under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And it may be because that person might be you know, hard to understand, might appear to be slurring their words or appear belligerent in their answers because they don't understand the language you're using. But again, uh, taking it all into, a, into consideration. Um, families may take medications off label. Uh, we have families that use the medicine clonidine uh, as a sleep aid, um, whereas, whereas most people use it, I believe, as a blood pressure medicine, but it is a higher level of sleep aid than melatonin, and a lot of our families get it prescribed for sleep. Um, but I, I guess in the medical field, you hear somebody's taking that, and you're going to think blood pressure. So uh, sometimes they do take it for other reasons, apparently. Different reaction to medications, doctors have told us from the hospital trainings we do, um, that the neurotypical patients have uh, sometimes more difficult to sedate. Uh, sedation is not the easiest for individuals on the autism spectrum or with other disabilities uh, and may need, may, may need more, uh, a higher level of, of sedation medicine um, to, to knock them out. Um, may, sometimes our, our kids will get uh, sedated for typical or even routine procedures. I have families that will get their kid put out for a teeth cleaning because going to the dentist is so difficult that they get put out to have their teeth cleaned, but they'll, they'll find doctors that are very friendly and say, listen, while he's out, I'm gonna get his hair cut and I'm gonna get his nails cut and I'm gonna get all this done because it's so difficult to get all this done um, uh, one time. So they find these doctors that, that have, that, that'll, that'll allow that because they understand how difficult it can be. Um, what, the, what that means, the patient might not be the person with an IDD is if I'm in a car wreck and I'm hurt and Max is not, it's gonna be harder to deal with him and his anxiety than probably dealing with me as a patient because he's gonna be so stressed out that he's gonna to need to be dealt with by somebody and helped uh, and taken care of um, in a way that, that you know, it's gonna be, you're gonna to have to figure out on the spot and find out things that work and think of those ways to communicate because he might not be able to communicate with you very effectively so thinking of those things we talked about, keeping it in the back of your head, uh, and maybe the easiest thing is let him come sit near me and that might be all he needs, um, but you may be dealing um, with two patients uh, in that situation. You're talking about people who are going through crisis, whether it's medical, uh, whether it's just the shock of being in an accident, it's something horrible happening. Um, you're talking about people who are in crisis and whether or not you consider their crisis legitimate is really irrelevant. Uh, it's the person who's going through it that's going through it. And while a low battery symbol doesn't make me panic, it is the first sign of the apocalypse for Max. He is worried. How am I going to get, what am I going to play? Where am I going to go to charge it? I don't have a charger with me. We're in the car. What are we going to do? And I can either tell him whatever, read a book and look out the window. That's not reducing any anxiety for my son. And something's going to get thrown at me from the back seat. So I have to be, and Max, here I've got a charger and the car will plug in. We're going to the restaurant. We have a charger with us to be able to plug in. I've got a go bag. I've got stuff that I can use here. Do you want to squeeze one of my fidgets? Where is my, I used to have a, a fidget ball sitting on, the, on my desk. It must have fallen on the floor. Um, squeeze, do you want something to hold on to? Do you want to do deep breathing exercises to help reduce your anxiety? All of these things we practice with him so we are able to reduce anxiety because I can't just ignore his crisis or blow it off because that really escalates him uh, also. Elopement and wandering is a major problem in the community. Uh, almost, and when I'm talking about elopement, I'm not talking about escaping from dangerous situations. I'm talking about wandering away from a safe situation. These are the statistics that 91% uh, has been updated. It is now 71%, still a terrifying statistic. 71% of deaths related to wandering caused by drowning. There's that fascination with water. So when kids go wandering or missing, uh, we tell anybody who gets called who, who's going to help, um, and I don't know if that's calls that you guys get or not, um, to look at bodies of water and get people close to bodies of water um, so that they can make sure that those bodies of water are going to be watched. So if any of the individuals going through those, um, you know, they can be kept safe, hopefully. Um, on our website, listen, I, I go a lot of information in a very short period of time, um, uh, and I want to get everybody out soon. Um, our website's fantastic, pathfindersforautism.org resources and safety information information are fantastic um, you can share them with families you can have them uh, in your in your in your firehouses in, in your houses where, where, where you work um, for families who, who you can share it with if they if they have kids that wander in a lope or kids who who run off 
uh, ways to I use identification tags, um, safety tattoos, all kinds of forms that they can fill out. I, I, you know, for a long time, I would bring uh, our, 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 my son around to these firehouses to introduce them to introduce them to the firemen so he can see them and know that they're safe and they're somebody you can go to. And this is what they look like when they're dressed fully like firemen. I'd make sure to bring them to so he could see that. So hopefully if he does have to see you in an anxiety inducing, um, if he does have to see a fireman in a really anxiety inducing situation, maybe that comfort level is a little bit more there because he's, he, he's met you before uh, and he feels safer with you. Um, great resources on the website, please feel free to share. This is a great group, but if I need help, that's a registry that if you, you let's say you come across an individual who's wandered and you, you see him walking down the side of the road, if you see somebody with a QR code on a belt buckle or a shoe tag or a backpack, take a picture of it. Um, your camera will link you to the website. That website might have emergency contact information for that person. Uh, great group, but if I need help.org. If you're in houses and you see things like this um, that might make you uncomfortable, that might make you question why things are like that, um, definitely inquire about it. You have resources to call. If you wanted to call Adult Protective Services or Child Protective Services because you see bars on the window or locks all over the doors. But if you have a kid that takes off running three times a month, I'm going to put locks on my door and take my chances in case of a fire that I'm going to not have one because I know for sure my kid's taken off outside the door. Um, so I'm going to lock it and put bars on my window so he can't get out. Um, but inquiring about why it's like that might get you the answer that, that it looks like one thing, uh, but is actually something else. Um, Lots of things. Uh, one of my coworkers has a son that that ratchet strap shut refrigerator was his life because he's got something called Prater Willi syndrome, uh, and his brain doesn't let us know. His stomach doesn't let his brain know it's full, and he'll eat and eat and eat uh, until he ruptures something and hurts himself. So, um, one of the things to do. Uh, a safety tat is a is a temporary tattoo that you can put on your on a person's arm that you can write your phone number on. Um, or you can get them printed with your phone number on them. There's a company that does that. Um, somebody asked in the chat box uh, and all that information that you could get. If you're going to the beach or the amusement park or whatever, uh, and, and that's the way you need your son to have some sort of or son or daughter, if they get separated to have that identification information, uh, I tell parents, listen, if it's a real risk, write it on their arm with a Sharpie. Because if somebody comes across a kid with his number written on his arm with a Sharpie and he's not with anybody, hopefully they call that number to find out why he's alone. Um, so those are all things we talk about with families uh, when we talk about safety and things like that. Um, things, uh, and I saw earlier in the chat, somebody talked about uh, working with individuals with IDDs and to give them space and to back off. Uh, I think it was John who had commented in the chat box that when working with individuals, it's a great idea, give somebody some more space. Three people crowded around somebody might trigger some sensory processing response, might trigger, trigger that anxiety, uh, so they may take off and run. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, giving somebody space and, and, and looking for that, that signs of anxiety from sensory processing, maybe backing off a little bit uh, can help slowing down the questions, things like that. Uh, wrapping a person in a blanket, giving them that, that deep pressure that then might help reduce anxiety. Uh, so if you're gonna be moving somebody, uh, during transport or rescue, they might enjoy, not enjoy, but might get a benefit out of being wrapped tight. That pressure can be calming. Um, uh, make sure to watch ahead, though, if they're moving it around. Uh, but sometimes that deep pressure, those, those weighted vests, weighted blankets, if you have a weighted blanket in your, in your vehicle, uh, sometimes a weighted blanket can help reduce anxiety uh, for individuals. Um, keep your language easy to understand. Take your time when asking questions, that 20-second rule giving people time to think of their answers, multiple communication methods. If they can't communicate with you verbally, if you write something down on a paper and give them paper and pen, can they communicate with you that way? If I type out a message to you on my phone and show it to you, can you read it and type back to me? When Max is really stressed, I'll type a message to him on my phone and slide my phone to him across the table. Uh, and it slows him down a bit as he looks to respond to it and read it. And sometimes he'll answer me verbally. And sometimes I'll just type the answer back because he knows the answer verbally, but having that conversation with me might be too anxiety inducing. So he'll type me the answer back. And it's just finding ways to communicate that can help him uh, looking for multiple communication methods. Um, you might be working with a patient. They're just asking you question after question after question. Uh, they might, if you can take the time 
to answer the question, it might reduce anxiety. And I'm saying might because everybody's so different. Um, but maybe just having the anxiety reduced by answering the question helps you communicate better, helps their behavior reduce, uh, and helps their life, their 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 um, interaction with you go better, and it reduces those negative interactions. Um, looking for communication devices. If you're transporting a patient uh, from a car accident or from a, a, a scene, um, and you leave, and they communicate with their phone or they communicate with an iPad, and you 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 leave the scene and you leave their words back home. You've taken their ability to communicate away. Uh, and remember, behavior is communication. So that person is going to communicate through behavior. Um, so make sure, you know, if you can, if they have a communication device, make sure you take that with you. Um, even if it's just something that helps reduce that person's anxiety to have that with them, um, it might make it easier uh, for everybody involved in the whole process. Um, speak to the person like you would any other patient. Use your name, use the person's name when you address them. Even something as simple as having a card like this, when it's green, I talk. Uh, when, when it's green, you talk. When it's red, I talk. Just showing somebody uh, how the back and forth goes because that art of conversation can be difficult. Some of the stuff we've already talked about. Uh, demonstrate, again, it depends on if you have time, uh, but showing somebody what you're going to do before you do it. I'm going to wrap this around your arm like this. I'm going to squeeze this bulb. It's going to tighten on your arm. Let's practice. Let me show you how it does. If you have time to do that, to show somebody what you're going to do, um, it might help reduce the anxiety. I don't know how practical that is, but keep it in the back of your head because someday it might be able to come in handy. Um, maintain calm demeanor. I'm, I'm assuming none of you are going to be screaming at people. Um, uh, again, avoid stopping those repetitive behaviors. It might help. Uh, unless that person's a risk of injury to themselves or others, let them stim because it might be what they need just to stay calm. Uh, Max is going to script. Max is going to talk to himself and repeat phrases over and over again to help reduce his anxiety. He might not be talking to you at all, but he'll be having a whole conversation with himself. Let, let him go. And if you don't need information from him at the time, let him go because that's keeping him so settled. Um, even better, if you know the script and you can jump in, that's going to make him love you even more because you're going to be finding one of those passions which is going to open up avenues of communication. If you have interactions with group homes, if you have to go into group homes for emergency situation. Um, people who live in group homes should have plans, behavior plans of how things are supposed to be followed in case of uh, behavior violations. Uh, it is not a HIPAA violation to ask to see somebody's plan if you're called there because they're having a major meltdown, a major problem. Uh, you can't just walk into a group home and say, I need to see Michael's plan. But if you're called for Michael, you are allowed to see Michael's plan. Um, to understand how you're supposed to deal with behavioral situations if you are the ones who are dealing with them. I've said it before, behaviors are communications. The two hour, not even two hours, the hour and 10 minutes we've been together might be more autism, IDD awareness, under, understanding training than the group home staff gets. The turnover rate is very high. Oftentimes there are language barriers between patients uh, and staff. Uh, but remember that behavior is communication because if every Monday night, Michael's having a major meltdown at 7.30, who's working with him at 7.30 and what's going on there and why is that causing, there's a pattern there. Maybe there's a communication being shown there through the behavior um, because of, of, of what's going on, looking at it that way. Um, I'll leave you with this because to me, it starts things off on the right foot completely. Uh, presume intellect. Um, start off where you think somebody should be. And if you have to come down and meet them where they are, it's a much better way, a much more positive way. It's a much, you, you don't want to have that negative interaction by, by treating somebody like a baby or, or, or assuming they can't understand anything you say just because they might be flapping or wearing headphones or showing or their disability projecting out. So start off with presume intellect. And I think that's really important. And I think I try and teach that everybody, to everybody that I talk to, whether it's you guys, uh, doctors and nurses in hospitals, teachers in schools, uh, other kids in schools is is that you know if you got a friend who's 15 years old talk to him like a 15 year old and you have to find another way to communicate uh, and find those passions um, do that because you know you might be throwing away a valuable opportunity um, and I hope that helps you not just in your life as uh, as professionals uh, but in personal life as well um, so let me take a look um, at my questions here in the chat box uh, and then. Um, uh, weighted blankets are awesome. I absolutely agree. Don't let other residents affect you most times. One is acting up and upsets the whole house. Absolutely. 
Uh, I would also uh, agree that yes, it causes a lot of stress in the entire house uh, when one person is acting up, I agree with you. Uh, it also leads me to the point of, uh, if you're coming into my house, listen to the parent, listen to the caretaker, because oftentimes I'm gonna know exactly what to tell you to talk to him about and what not to do with him and language that not to use. Uh, and yeah, you might've been on the job for 20 years, but I've been raising them for 16 and I know the best way to help him de-escalate and you don't. So you're not gonna get anywhere unless he de-escalates and you should listen to me, at least taking into what I say into account. I speak from experience as my son, my wife felt un unsafe with my son one day and had to call the police. And I had two police in my, in my kitchen when I came home who didn't, apparently hadn't taken our training class uh, and didn't know how to interact with Max or deal with him. And he's sitting in the kitchen yelling, don't shoot me, I don't wanna go to jail. And they're yelling back at him, I'm not gonna shoot you, but you're yelling at him and you're talking too fast and you're not giving him time to de-escalate. And you're making him stay in the kitchen and let him stay instead of letting him go into the living room where his toys are. And all these things are escalating his anxiety. Um, and my wife was unable to help them at that time communicate with him. And when I came in, I was able to help out a little bit um, because he was able to de-escalate when I came in because I wasn't the enemy at that point in time. But it could have gone horribly. It could have been lots of negative interaction leading from that. Um, so listen to the caretaker. Uh, please make sure to, oh, <laughs> I'm reading that. Please make sure to sign into the link. Very important. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, that's great. She's seen my presentation before at Crisis Team Training. Uh, if anybody wants to, I guess if you're not, I don't know if you're automatically muted, if you want to open your mics, uh, ask me any questions. I'm more than happy to answer. Otherwise, here's my contact information right there. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me um, for anything you need, whether it has to do with your life. Maybe I have a question. Life. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, actually, let me see. I guess the, the situation that I've come across in the past was when you arrive on scene, you're dealing with a developmentally delayed patient. And of course, they've been aggressive. So the police officer has them in a very compromising position that could be potentially harmful. How, as a provider, do we address that about sounding like, you know, you know, I don't want to step on the toes of the police officer, but how do we take care of it so we don't let our patient get hurt? Uh, I would love to be able to answer that question for you, but I don't, I don't know what protocol would be and where, where everything comes into that. I mean, I don't know how it would come off to suggest to them, maybe just saying, listen, can you sit them up? Can you turn them on their side? Can you give them, you know, he's at a risk for asphyxia in that position letting them know the risks because maybe they don't understand the risks um, of that particular position. Uh, but like I tell police officers, listen, you have to get a situation into, a, into, into control before you can do any of the things we talk about with de-escalation. And so I don't know where that situation started from to be able to tell you how to tell them not to do what they're doing. Um, but letting them know that, you know, if that person has a disability, they are at a higher risk for a positional asphyxiation or, or have a higher um, tolerance for pain, uh, where you that, that hold's not going to do what you think it's going to do because he might not be feeling it at the same level that most typical individuals, neurotypical individuals do. Um, so I'm not sure that's more of a, on a professional level. I don't know what type of interaction you're allowed to have in that situation. Anybody else? So, um, reach out to me if you have any questions. Check out our website. There's lots of great information. Um, we're always happy to come do trainings, whether it's hopefully one day, knock on wood, we'll be able to do them live again. Um, but uh, we can do uh, a, a, a video, a Zoom presentation, uh, no problem. Uh, it is free. So if you take it back to someplace uh, that you think would be great and it would be valuable, let them know there's no charge to come out and do it or to do it this way. Um, and, and Sean will tell you, we're really easy to deal with. We're very flexible here. Uh, we, just, we want the information shared. Uh, and like I said, I'll talk to anybody about it because it's such an important thing to me because uh, I want your job to be easier and my son's life to be easier. So I think this is a good way to do it. And uh, I'm glad to answer anybody's questions or wish you all a very good night and a happy first night of Hanukkah to anybody celebrating and happy holidays. Neil, that was just amazing. Thank you so much for spending the time with us, for your sharing your passion uh, in this topic. It was really, I think, literally one of the best speakers we've had in two years. 
So well, you're very kind. Really, I mean, I great, totally practical information, things that we yeah. all struggle with for sure. Yeah. Um, for those who are online with us, so don't forget. So Ashley sent out a sign-in sheet that bit.ly uh, forward slash autism 20. Um, Neil's team also shared the uh, slides. Uh, those slides are available. Ashley, again, converted that into a little bit.ly uh, um, website mm -hmm. address, autism PDF. Hopefully you can see that in the chat as well. And then again, Neil provided his email uh, if you want to reach out to him or have any other, yeah, if you want to contact him. Absolutely. We'd be glad to talk to anybody. I completely agree, Nikki. Best presentation yet. 